Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. If you're watching, comment. Let's see if I can put the comments side by side. Okay, whatever. Okay. Good evening. How's everyone doing? Get the wrong book for tonight. You're all your day ahead, huh? Let's just check, make sure the stream is on. Randy says, see you later. <laughs> what? Okay, we're live. I see me on Facebook. Look at that. What? Okay. You ready, gentlemen? Ladies? Let's get some viewers. L'chaim. It's good to see everyone. Ready? Tonight's class is dedicated in the memory of Yitzchak Tzib and Yosef. The Shem have an elevation, and I want to also dedicate memory of the 17 uh, innocent people that were killed in Stoneman Douglas four years ago, even though it's not the yard site, but it's a day of commemoration regardless. And so our learning should be in memory of their souls as well, that they should, uh, they and their families, you know, happiness and good things and blessings, etc. Okay, let us talk about one of the most famous stories in all of the Torah. One of the most famous stories in Judaism. One of the most impactful uh, stories in Judaism, which is the story of the golden calf. Now, you all know the story, generally speaking, but let's go through the story in detail. There's some fascinating details I want to share with you that some of you may know, some of you will most likely not know, and then we're going to really understand the crux of this, of this, uh, of this incident understand how in the world was it possible for the Jewish people to have sinned with the golden calf. But we'll get there. Let's first start with the beginning of the story. We all know on the sixth day of the month of Sivan, the Jewish people stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. They saw God. They heard God. They experienced firsthand a divine revelation unlike that which any other human would ever see, had seen, or would ever see again in the course of human history. It was a tremendous, awesome, unbelievable experience. And the first two of the Ten Commandments begins where God says, Anochi, Hashem I am the Lord your God, who? This is important, who did what? Who took you out of Egypt, very good. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Remember that, I'm going to go back to those words later on. And number two, they hear directly from God. What's the second commandment? Not to worship any other gods. You shall have no other gods in front of me or besides for me. Don't make any molten images. Don't make any, uh, let's say the word golden calves, but that's uh, it's almost there. These two commandments, the Jewish people here, direct from God Himself. The what? They heard it directly from God. Direct. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> <laughs> we were there. We were there. Not just we were there, not just we were there, the other eight commandments about Shabbos and about, you know, uh, giving false testimony, that we heard through Moshe. But the first two, I am the Lord your God, I'm going to talk about that first commandment as well later on. I am the Lord your God, who took you out of Egypt. We heard directly, I mean, we also saw God take us out of Egypt, but we heard that from the mouth of God, and no other God besides for me. So we hear that. What happens the next day? Moshe goes up the mountain for 40 days in order to receive the entirety of the Torah. At Mount Sinai, the Jews had only received 10 commandments. That's Sarah Tadibro. So Moshe goes back up the mountain to receive the rest of the Torah and to also receive the Torah Shabal Peb, which is the oral Torah. Okay, and there's a lot about that too, but that's not for right now. The Jews start, and Moshe tells them, I'm going up the mountain for 40 days. While I'm gone, I'm leaving you in the control or under the jurisdiction of Aharon and Chor. Chor, we mentioned briefly, was the nephew of both Moshe and Aaron. He's the da- his daughter. He's the son of Miriam. That's correct. We mentioned him. So Aaron and Chor, they will be the ones in charge. If you have any questions, go to them. And I'll see you in 40 days. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. I was about to say that. 
Let me explain. Let me say. Let me say. I'm, I'm middle of saying the story. Let me let me say it. <laughs> so the Jews right away start counting forty days. Forty days are counting, and they're counting. Now, when Moses said, "I'm going up the mountain for forty days," what did he mean? Forty Jewish days. What's a Jewish day? Forty Jewish days. You can say a Jewish day is a day that never ends. You know, say like when you have Jewish guests come over and they say goodbye but never leave, right? So that's a Jewish day. Yeah, we're leaving in five minutes. Six hours later, it's still it's still day. But uh, no, on, on on the serious note, a Jewish day is a day that begins at the night before. We all know that. When does Shabbat begin? Friday at night. So Yom Kippur begins at night, etc., etc. Pesach is at night. So when Moshe said 40 days, he meant 40 days where the night precedes the day. They started counting the day that Moshe went up. He went up in the morning, on the next day, on the seventh day. So they are counting 40 days. Comes the 16th of the month of Tammuz, which is 40 days, including the day that Moshe had gone to the mountain, and it already passes noon. The Torah says, Kibo Shesh Moshe, that Moshe was towering to come down, which explains, Kibo Shesh, the sixth hour of the day had already passed. So they begin to panic. It's not the end of the day yet, but it's already the afternoon. And they were sure that Moshe would come in the morning. So it's already afternoon, and they start to get nervous. What else happens? The Satan starts to create what's called Maisa Satan. Maisa Satan means where the Satan has the ability, the given rights by God, to create illusions, to create distractions that are not real, but they look real. In our minds, they're real. You know, they, they, that's a goal, it looks real. And the Satan created a darkness and a gloom and a doom. It became very dark. The sky is darkened. The clouds came out. It wasn't just like dark, the sky was not. Sometimes like, like, you know, I feel like it's like, like gloomy. It's like scary outside. Everything came dark. There was an ervuvia. There was a, there was a feeling of confusion in the air that the Satan created. And then not only that, the Satan created the image of the coffin of Moshe Rabbeinu in the sky. As if they were actually able to see that Moshe had passed away and he was being carried by the angels on a coffin in the heavens, on a, on a bed in the heavens. Now again, it wasn't real, but it was Maisa Satan. Maisa Satan means something which in our minds looks real to create this illusion that Moshe has died and the Jewish people are now abandoned. They no longer have a Moshe Rabbeinu to lead them and to guide them. No. The Jewish people get very worried. They literally panic. And in a mob mentality, they come to Aaron and to Chor, who are the people in charge, and they say, we want, make for us a God, make for us something. We're going to soon read the text exactly what they say. But we need a God. And Hur, who's young, hot-blooded, you know, uh, idealistic, starts to scream at them and says, absolutely not. This is a sin. You can't make another God. And that's idol worship. And what do the people do? They stone him to death. They stone him to death. Now, Aaron's a little bit smarter, a little bit more, you know, uh, calm than his nephew. He's able to, like, think and react appropriately, so this is not a good idea. If I'm going to go tell them that they're wrong and try to argue with them, I'll be killed too. And then what will happen? Then it'll be like, you know, real free-for-all. So Aaron, this is all hinted in the words as well, but Aaron says, I'm going to help you. Everyone come, go to your wives, go to your children, bring me their jewelry, and we will uh, make, a, a, we'll make a, a, a God. What happens? The women didn't want to give their jewelry. That's right. Marsha knows. The women don't want to give their jewelry. So Aaron did that on purpose. Aaron knew that women don't give away jewelry so fast. He was a married man. <laughs> he was married. He knew how it worked. He had, he had daughter-in-law. So Chur was a... Not about it. He had four sons, but he knew how daughters work. So, um, so he uh, says, go to your wife, get the jewelry, and then come back to me. He was sure. Until they negotiate, until they get the jewelry. It's going to take some time. What happened? The women didn't want to get the jewelry, so the men were so desperate for a god, so eager, they pulled off their own jewelry, their own rings, their own earrings, whatever it was they were wearing, and their, their nose rings, and they give it to Aaron. Next thing you know, there's a huge pile of gold in front of Aaron. And it goes around. No, she said the men's earrings. I said the men who said were earrings. This is the reason why religious men don't wear jewelry. Side note, but very interesting note, why do religious men not wear jewelry? Mm -hmm. You know why? Why is it in Judaism that it's not a sin? The, it's a result of this story right here by the golden calf. Since the men have proven themselves incapable of 
using their jewelry in a proper uh, controlled way and they got carried away in the moment and they use their jewelry for a sin. Therefore, men lost their kind of their right to wear jewelry. Now, although again, it's a custom, it's not a halacha, there's no sin for a man to wear jewelry, but you don't normally see religious men wearing jewelry for that reason. That's why I don't wear a wedding ring, etc. Men don't wear... So a watch you can wear because it's not for jewelry. It has a, it has a purpose. It has a, uh, has a uh, utilitarian purpose as opposed to a necklace or a ring or whatever, which is purely decorative. It has no purpose. But I don't like the feel of a watch on my hands. And uh, uh, Anyway, so... Um, okay, so here we have men don't behave properly with their jewelry and therefore they lose the right to wear jewelry. The women hold their jewelry to themselves. If they till today, women wear jewelry. And they make this massive golden cap, this massive pile of gold. So now Aaron says, okay, I'll make it, I'll form it, because he sure will take time. So let me put it to the fire to melt it. Now what happens next? There's different opinions that are brought. But we know that a golden calf walks out of the fire. Walks out of the fire, as in exactly what I said, it walks out. The golden statue had life in it, and the statue walked out of the oven or furnace that they had put the gold into. The main two explanations given, number one, is that amongst the Erev amongst the, we know there's a multitude of, of Egyptians who are not Jews, that had joined the Jewish people on the way out of Egypt, and that Moshe had decided that even though they weren't properly Jewish, and they hadn't gone through a proper conversion, they had not proven their, their sincerity and their commitment to living a life dedicated to God, but Moshe said, it's good, you know, the more the merrier, it's not good to be too strict, let's take them along. And what happened? So one of the times the Jews suffered as a result of having converts, and they used their black magic to make this pile of gold turn into an idol. Oh, that's the second thing. That's the second explanation. So that's one classic explanation given by commentaries, is that the calf literally came alive and had a spirit within it that made it look godly as a result of the black magic of the Eru I told you I told you I'm going to say some things tonight you didn't know before, right? <laughs> if you know everything I'm going to teach, then I, go, I retire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you're a good student. <laughs> yeah. Know, yeah One day you know everything that I know. Actually, I didn't even know the whole thing about the golden calf until Robert told me at the Seder last year. <laughs> well, we learned this. Okay. Anyway, the second, the second explanation for how this calf came to life is, as you said correctly, Marcia, there was a young boy. His name was, anyone know? Micha. Micha was a little boy that had been taken by Egypt, by Egypt, by the Egyptian taskmaster, by Pharaoh, and stuffed into the walls of the pyramids. When the Jews did not meet their quotas, to have enough bricks that they needed, Egyptian, the, the Egyptian taskmaster would take the Jewish kids and stuff them into the walls, kill them, take their skulls and put them in the walls, as they, uh, to fill the quota. Part of the terror and the dehumanization, like in the Holocaust, that happened to the Jewish people, in the slave labor, slave labor of Egypt. So, Moshe, I said, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing these children to be killed like this? So Moshe, God says to Moshe, okay. No, it was a Jewish boy. It was a Jewish boy. But that God had decreed to be killed. So when Moshe complains to God, God said, okay, go ahead. Save a boy and see, see what happens when you try and argue with my plan. So Moshe was given permission by God to save one of the boys and to adopt him as his own child. This is Micha. Now, on the day of the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt, Micha was hanging around with his adopted father, Moshe. And what was Moshe doing on the day when all the Jews left Egypt? He was, right, while all the other Jews were running around collecting and borrowing gold and silver and clothing and jewelry and vessels and dishes from all their Egyptian neighbors, what was uh, Moshe doing? He was looking for the bones of Joseph, of Yosef at Sadiq. If you remember, before Yosef dies, he makes the Jews swear to him. When, he, when Jacob died, Yosef was able to bury him in Israel right away. But when Yosef died, he wasn't able to be buried in Egypt, in, in Israel. He was buried in Egypt. So he makes the Jewish people swear an oath that when the day of their redemption will eventually come, they promise that they will bury him, take them out of Egypt with them, and bury him in Israel. So Moshe is looking for the bones of Yosef. The problem is, where were the bones of Yosef? They were buried in a steel coffin. Another excellent student right here. <laughs> buried in a steel coffin under, in the Nile River. The Egyptians knew that Yosef wanted to leave Egypt. And they didn't want Yosef to leave Egypt. 
So what did they do? They sunk his bones into the Nile River. How are you going to get the bones out of the Nile River? <laughs> Go scuba diving, get them out, like, you know, take a submarine. That's it. They were sure that they put the bones into the Nile River. Yosef's bones would remain, his body would remain in Egypt forever and ever. So what does Moshe do? When all the Jews are leaving, he takes either a parchment or a plate, something, a shard of clay, and he puts, and on he writes the words, Alei Shur, rise up, O ox. Why an ox? Because in the blessings, each tribe is compared to, metaphorically compared to a different animal or a different feature, and Yosef is compared to an ox that bears the burden, that has strong shoulders. So Yosef is compared to an ox. So Moshe writes the words, Alei Shur, rise up, O ox, and the miracle happens, and the steel coffin that had in it the bones of Yosef and buried in the bottom of the Nile rises up to the, uh, to the top. And Moshe gets the body, gets the coffin, takes Yosef's bones out of Egypt. What happened to that paper, to that piece of clay, depending on which version? Micha, the little boy, was there, he took it. When all of the men threw their gold and their jewelry into a big pile, Micha put his paper with the words, Rise up, O ox, into this pile. And they put into the fire, together with this paper, rise up, O ox. And because the paper that Moshe had written, rise, O ox, was written, it was in there, out came a baby ox, which is a calf. Golden calf, the baby ox, because of the paper that Moshe had written, that Micha had taken, where God said, you will see how this child will end up being your uh, harm later on. Okay. Anyway, Aaron says, guys, we didn't make an altar. You know, he realizes everything's going way too fast. Aaron deliberately agrees to do it, everything for them because he wants to slow them down as much as possible. So he says, Chag Hashem Machar. Tomorrow will be a holiday for Hashem. And in his mind, he was hoping that it'll be a holiday for Hashem. The Moshe will come before the Jews, the Jews have a chance to actually sin and that he will, uh, everything will be okay. And it'll be a day of celebration with the tablets, a day for Hashem. Um, so he says, if I'm going to let them all build the, the altar, this guy will bring a, uh, you know, a hammer, this guy will bring a stick, next thing you know, I'll be built. I'll do it slowly, I'll take my time, I'll, I'll measure twice, uh, take my time. But they make it go very, very quickly. And it says in the morning, they got up early in the morning to go worship this golden calf. And they got up very, very early. And the Erev Ra that was amongst them, this multitude of people says, Eira Lekecha, you saw this is your God of Israel. And they begin to litzachik, to literally to play in front of the idol, which I mentioned this, I think, last week. Litzachik, the word to play, has three evil connotations. To worship idols, to commit murder, and to commit uh, immoral sins and to have an orgy of immoral behavior. All three were done by the golden calf. They worshipped an idol, they killed Chor, and they were also committing immoral acts in front of this idol, which is the proof. How to know if something is holy or unholy? Look at where it leads to, and usually you'll see. But that's another discussion. Wow. Moshe is told by God to go down the mountain. God says to Moshe, your people have sinned. The whole dialogue between Moshe and God is for a different time. Moshe goes down the mountain. Who's waiting for him at the mountain, at the foot of the mountain? Yoshua. No, Aaron's with the people. Yoshua. Joshua is there. And what is Joshua? And when Joshua is there, wait a minute, he has not known anything was going on. Yoshua had remained at the foot of Mount Sinai for the entire 40 days when Moshe was on the mountain. He was camped on the bottom of the mountain waiting for his teacher to come back. You know, when you go out of the home and your puppy's like waiting for you by the front door, like, right? <laughs> That was Yeshua, waiting by the foot of the mountain, didn't want to leave. So Yeshua was waiting there, and he says to Moshe, I hear, I hear a voice of war in the camp. He heard the commotion of the golden calf, and the singing, and the... He didn't know what he heard, just heard noise. So I hear a voice of war. So Moshe responds to Joshua, and says to him, what you're hearing is not the voice of victory. It's not, you know, when you have a war, and you're winning, eh. It's not the voice of when your people are losing and they're crying out, help, help. It's not that. Kol anis A voice of corruption, of perversion, is what you're hearing right now. The people have become corrupted, they have become perverted, they have become destroyed. It's bad news. I think I hear that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, they come, and immediately a punishment descends upon them. They come, Moshe breaks the tablets, well, there's another whole conversation, why he broke the tablets, he breaks the tablets, and at that point he punishes the Jewish people for the sin of the golden calf. There's different punishments for different people. He gathers all the Levites around him, 
and all those that had been witness committing the golden calf, and they had been warned not to worship an idol, the tribe of Levi never sinned. So the tribe of Levi, which is where Chor came from, was trying to stop the people the next morning, saying this is a sin. So those that had been warned and had uh, committed the sin, they were killed by, by the sword. The tribe of Levi killed 3,000 people that were found guilty and judged and killed 3,000 people. In addition to that, there were those that had been seen sinning. There was witnesses, but they hadn't been warned. Um, so they died by a plague. It says that while Moshe was on the mountain, Hashem sent the plague amongst the Jews that killed more Jews. I don't know what number. In addition to that, those who had not been witnessed worshipping the golden calf. There was no two witnesses from the tribe of Levi. And they had them warned, but they had worshipped the golden calf. So Moshe treated them the way an, a wayward woman is treated. If a woman is warned by her husband not to be intimate with a certain man, not to be alone with a certain man that he's suspicious of. And then there's witnesses that these two people were secluded. We don't know, I mean, we don't have any witnesses in actual deed, but we know that they were hanging out together. So then she's called Asota, and Asota is given water to drink to test her righteousness. What's in the water she drinks? It's a whole long story in the parasha of Nassau. She, um, she, they write the name of God on the parchment, they erase the ink of the parchment into the water, she drinks the water, and, that's, and that tests her. And if she's innocent, the water becomes a blessing for her, and if she's guilty, her stomach explodes and it's a very painful death. So those Jews that had not been witnessed and not uh, been warned, Moshe took the golden, the, the, the golden calf, he crushed it. What did they do with this golden calf? He broke it, he grinded it up, mixed it into water, and made the people drink the water. And those people that had sinned secretly in their hearts by worshipping the golden calf, they, their stomachs blew up from drinking this water that had the golden calf you know, ashes or not, like ashes or crumbs or whatever uh, mixed into it. And then you have all this other, you have the area of Rav that wasn't punished at that time, and God says, I'm going to hold their punishment against them for a future time. So you have, it's not 3,000, 3,000 just people were killed by the Levites. I don't know the number, how many people were actually killed in that two day period uh, on the day of the golden calf the next day. But um, you do see here that the people, besides those who were actually punished for worshiping the golden calf, you see that God wants to destroy the entire Jewish nation. Terrible thing, and Moshe goes back up the mountain, and he says, Hashem, forgive them. And that's another whole story how God eventually agrees to forgive the Jewish people. But, yeah. Why did, why did God not um, destroy all of the Arab world? Why did he allow some children to Most of them lived on. Uh, because they had not been witnessed. It's, it's a little bit technical. Oh, okay. They hadn't, there was no witnesses to their crime. They hadn't been warned before their crime. And therefore they were, and since they were not full Jews, they were not yet considered God's wife. So they weren't guilty of adultery, comparing idolatry to adultery. And so therefore they weren't punished. Then God said, I'm going to hold it against them. And in the future times they were punished for this, to, for this sin as well. So there were people embedded within the Jewish people that still carry the guilt of the sin of the golden calf. Yeah. How many people so it's an excellent question. So I'm saying, I don't know the exact number. There, there's definitely Jews that were, were instigators. There were Jews that were silent observers. That meaning, some, some observers, they were silently participating without doing anything. And then there were Jews that were silent, didn't agree, but were silent and didn't protest. The only people that protested was the tribe of Levi. Meaning there was no one from any other tribe that protested against what was going on. So there's three categories. I don't know numbers. But even there were those that did this, those that publicly worshipped, those that privately in their hearts worshipped, and those that didn't agree with the golden calf, but were afraid to say anything. They went along, so to say, with the, uh, they didn't stand up and speak out. The tribe of Levi spoke out, which is why it's at this point that the first warned of all the tribes lose their right to serve in the Mishkan, later on in the temple, and only the tribe of Levi, that were the only people that actually protested against the golden calf, it became the tribe of Levi. So that's the question, how many people participated? Only a small, only one tribe protested. We, I don't know the breakdown of how much was in each camp. Like we left Egypt, about 60, 60 There was two, three million Jews. And that's not even including the area around. That's the way it counts. There's so a few million Jews that were there. Yeah. Why didn't they just 
It's a good question. Why? That's a good question. And the first question is, why couldn't Aro just say to them, you're miscounted. You counted the wrong day. And then they would have explained to them. It's a good question. A simple answer would be, logical explanations don't work for a crowd that's in a mob mentality of panic and fear. Once the people panicked and said that was going to happen to us, yeah, there's logical explanations. But logic only works when you're having a logical conversation. <laughs> Once you're having an emotional conversation, all the logical answers in the world are not going to help you. Yeah, but they let, they let, I mean, they gave him their jewelry to create, which leads me to the next question. What, why a calf? Is there something about a calf that's special? We'll talk about a calf. So the simple reason why a calf is because on the paper that Moshe had written for Yosef is that Alei Shur, rise up a ox, that's why there's a calf. But I will soon give you a beautiful explanation from the Ramban about the, why a golden calf, not a golden, uh, I don't know, horse. <laughs> golden horse. Okay? Why a calf, not a horse? We'll talk about that. We will. First, I have a question for you. My turn to ask you guys a question. You ready? Good evening, everyone that's watching. Good evening, Andrea. Good evening, Rika. Good evening, Faith. Good evening, everyone else that's watching. I didn't comment. Okay. Can you guys relate to this? Can Imagine that you were there in that year, 2,448, you had just been, from the people that left Egypt, you were a nation of slaves, miraculously taken out of Egypt, experienced the ten plague, experienced the splitting of the sea, experienced the bread coming down from the heavens, experienced the well of Miriam, saw God at Mount Sinai. Could you imagine yourself worshipping this golden calf? No. <laughs> yeah, no. No. Technically no, but I heard an explanation, a good one about this. Okay. Okay, so the fire is saying, I'm going to repeat it for those that are watching online, that you're saying, you're saying a good answer, and it's a true answer, it's a very basic answer, that, I mean, that's the true answer, that's on the most basic level, that is the truth, that the Jewish people were steeped in idolatry, and especially the area of Rav amongst them, had, you know, they all grew up in Egypt, and this was their culture, this was their style, so in the moment of panic, in the moment, the, 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 your natural, you revert back to your natural instincts, and therefore the natural instinctual desire to worship an idol resurfaced and they couldn't resist and that's why they worship idols. Plus, Plus, the Jews were kind of scammed. They were set up. Because if I'm looking at Moses died and he's in a coffin, whether it's real or not, it's a, I'm looking at it and then I see a golden calf just come alive and walk. What, you know, how do you blame them that they're being set up? But what about You're, all the times where it's like you, they received the manna and, you know, all the other you're asking an excellent question. So Yonatan's question, really, if I'm making the question a little bit better, is that basically they were set up, you said it, you said they were set up, God's allowing the Satan to create this illusion, and there was a real illusion. They saw, so that they, the, the clouds became dark, the sky became dark, the clouds became like, a, you know, foreboding, and, and they saw an image of a coffin in the sky, you know. God is testing them. God set them up. And if we wanted to give a whole other class about teshuva and about repentance, I could explain to you for another hour why this part of God's plan and how after the golden calf we reach a deeper level of connection with God than before the golden calf. We could absolutely go there, but that's not tonight's class because that's about teshuva. I want to understand the sin of the Jewish people. Right? You tell me before, people, sometimes we don't focus enough on the sin. How did the people sin? And the question is not just how did those people back then sin, but if we understand what was their sin, what led them to do the sin that they did, we're going to discover soon that the sin was not so far-fetched. In fact, to some level, all of us are guilty of a similar kind of sin that maybe has a different expression in today's culture, in today's society, but it's actually not very different at all than the sin of the golden calf. And you're giving me a very dubious look. You're skeptical. Okay, let's see if in a half hour you're still skeptical. Okay? So, first of all, we got to go back. Now let's go look at the text. So let's understand what exactly did the Jews say when they wanted to make a golden calf, right? We can't, we can talk about it. Let's go read the text. So, text number one. You all have a sheet in front of you. Um, this is the opening verse of chapter 32, which is the beginning of the story of the golden calf. Torah tells us, 
But the nation saw, the people saw, that Moses was late in coming down from the mountain. The people gathered against Aaron. And they said to him, listen to the next words, Come on, make us gods that will go before us, because this man Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. I'm going to read the last part of that verse again to make sure the point that you get this. Come make us gods, because the man Moshe, Kizem Moshe Ha'ish, this man Moses, who took us out from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. Before I talk about it, what? Let's all wait a second. Let me let me read the text. Let's give you a minute. Right, we're gonna skip the text number two, which is the same chapter. Now, verse twenty-one. Verse twenty-one in context is after Moshe comes down the mountain, and Moshe says to Aaron, "What did you do, Aaron? What did the people do to you that they made you do this terrible sin that you built an altar and you made a golden calf? What were you thinking, Aaron?" Here, verse twenty-one. Moses says to Aaron, "What did these people do to you? They brought such a grave sin upon them." So Aaron replied, verse twenty-two. Let my Lord's anger grow, let not my Lord's anger grow hot. You know the people, that they are disposed toward evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us, because, why do we want a God? Because this man, Moses, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. What are the Jews saying here, my friends? Why do they want an idol? Why do they want a God? Because they want a new God? Or because they want a new Moshe? The Torah is saying clearly, clearly, black and white, it's not a commentary. They say clearly, and Aaron repeats these exact words to Moshe later on. It wasn't God they're looking to replace. It was you, it was Moshe they were looking to replace. Never in a moment did the Jewish people ever say, we're looking for a new God. Which is what Nofar was saying before, and there is a, you know, on the basic level, they lost faith in God. They never ever were looking to replace Hashem. They were looking for a replacement for their conduit to God, for their intermediary, the one that connected them to God, the one who actually did the miracles, who did the plagues. They knew who did the plagues, Moshe or God. They knew it was God doing the plagues, but he did it through Moshe. Who gave him the Torah? God gave it through Moshe. So now we say, "Uh uh-oh, if Moshe's gone, how do we connect to God? Moshe's the guy that connected. When we needed food, we came to Moshe. And Moshe got us bread from the heaven. We needed water, we went to Moshe. Everything we need, we go to Moshe. Moshe got it for us from Hashem. So now I've lost my contact. I've lost my, my in Hebrew we call it a memutza, the intermediary, the, the connection that exists between us and God. It's gone, he's dead, he's not here. The, the day is passing, the sun is setting. We don't have a Moshe. Help, we need a new Moshe because the man Moshe who took us out of Egypt that man, we don't know what happened to him. We need a replacement for the connection that we have to Hashem. We need a new leader. One sec. Let me finish proving this point. In fact, what do they say? They say, the man Moshe, Asher Elanu, who took for a, who, this man Moshe went before us, we don't know what happened to him. He clearly, I'm sorry. Make for us a new God who will go before us. What does the word that who will go before us mean? Look back in the verse number one. Make us gods that will go before us. Not who will replace God, who will be our intermediary, who will be the people, the, the connection that will be before us when we want to get to God. We don't know how to talk to God directly. We know how to talk to Moshe. So we need a new replacement. Well, I'm going to address that in a second. I'm going to address, <laughs> I'm going to address it in a second, the word God. I'm going to address that in a second. I want to make one more point. In addition, in addition, when Moshe comes down the mountain, what does Moshe do? He breaks his God. As I mentioned before, I mentioned on purpose, he grinds up this golden calf, sprinkles it into the water, makes everyone drink it. Now imagine they had actually believed that this golden calf was a real God. Would they let Moshe come destroy their God and pour and mix it into water and make it part of the Kool-Aid? <laughs> Who drank the Kool-Aid, huh? <laughs> well, Moshe, would you do that? If you were worshiping a God and you thought that this golden calf was alive and you thought it was real, would you then let some Moshe come? Oh, Moshe, you came back. If, if this God 
in this golden cloud is not replacing Moshe, but it's replacing God in heaven. Who is Moshe to kill their God? But if the golden calf is to replace Moshe, and now Moshe has returned, who needs this golden calf? Kill it, destroy it, burn it, break it, do whatever you want. They're all, you understand? The fact that they allow this golden calf to be destroyed is the ultimate proof that they had never viewed this golden calf as a replacement of God. No, God is the same God. God never changed. They know who God is. What they were looking to replace was the man Moshe who went before us. We don't know where he is. Oh, now he's here. Okay, throw that in the garbage. Instead, <laughs> grind it up, mix it into the water, and serve it as a, you know. That was the first question. It's a good question. It's making me nuts. Uh oh. <laughs> don't go nuts, Vivi. We need to stay normal. <laughs> okay, you understand? This is a critical point. The purpose of the golden calf is not to be a god. It's to be a replacement of the person that had connected them with God. So, Uh-oh, my battery's so wrong. Yes. So then why, was it, why is God so mad at them? If you're not replacing God. Why is it so mad? Oh, good question. <laughs> One second before we lose... Ah, uh... oh, plugged in. Okay, perfect. So why has God mad at them? It's a good question, very good question, but we're not done yet. So let's first explain now. So, so why are they panicking? Why can't they wait the day till Moshe comes back? So Moshe's gone. Right away, immediately, the second you don't see Moshe, you immediately make a new Moshe. You know what I'm saying? So, so on a simple level, what happened here? The Jewish people that left Egypt are compared to a brand new baby that's born. They left Egypt. Egypt is like the birth canal, the Mitzar, the narrow uh, opening of the birth womb. Uh, of the womb of the mother, they're just born, that's why God had to feed them and weigh them and put them in a cloud of glory, like a little baby, right? Babies can't take care of themselves, you gotta feed them and you gotta dress them and, you know, swaddle them and all that. So the Jewish people are still too spiritually immature to be able to fend for themselves and create a relationship directly with God. It's like a little baby. They need to see their parents to feel safe, right? They can't go to sleep unless you're sitting in the room with them. They want to know, you know, my, my daughter Bracha, she's attached to me, she literally won't let me out of her sight. They, they need to see you. They need to feel close. So for the Jewish people who are spiritually young, who are spiritually immature, just like a child will panic if their parent walks out of the room. They didn't go anywhere. But they'll, they'll panic if the parent walks out of the room. So too, you know, take your kid to school, right? The first day they're, they're, they're going crazy. So the same thing. The Jewish people, all of a sudden, hey, where did, where, where did my father go? Where did Moshe go? Where's my... And because of that, that's why they panicked. They, 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 they went crazy and said, we need a replacement. That's on the basic level. On a little bit of a deeper level, the Jews, I'll use a little bit of a strong language, were addicted to divine revelation. Their entire existence has been exclusively about unbelievable spiritual high, spiritual revelations. From the giving of the Torah, the splitting of the sea, the bread from the heavens, the ten plagues, they didn't know in their mind, they couldn't fathom how to create a connection to God that is man-made. Right? Today we understand that we have a man-made relationship with God. We have to create a relationship with God. We have to work on it, we got to pray, we got to meditate, we got we to work to create a relationship with God. The Jews had never ever done such a thing. Their entire spiritual experience had exclusively been an experience of revelation. From above, inspiration where God is revealing and Moshe is teaching and anything they need is just given to them. Just given to them on the golden platter. And therefore, because they were so, they become so, like, like a kid who like depend on parents giving them everything. They, learn, they, they, they don't know how to be independent. They don't know how to take care of themselves. Have a kid, always you do everything for them. <laughs> One day you don't do something, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to turn on the uh, microwave by themselves. So the Jews... Everything was Moshe. No divine revelation. No, no one just give us whatever we need, when we need it, as we need it, on instant demand. They couldn't, they, couldn't, they couldn't exist that way. They couldn't even imagine how they would survive as a people without consistent divine revelation. So therefore they panic and they right away say, we need a new Moshe. Because without a Moshe, without someone to go before us, to give us constant revelation... We can't survive as a people. We can't survive as a nation. And therefore they said, 
Quick, 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 quick. Make us something to replace Moshe. Understand? Make sense? There's a problem. I think Barbara asked. But they're calling, oh, you guys said why I was God angry. But someone asked. But they're calling a God. So maybe the fire, someone asked. They're calling it a God. They are using the word God here. Not only that, let's go look at text number three. Text number three is from the same chapter, verse number four now. So this is after they put the gold, the gold into the fire and then the golden calf walks out. He says this verse, he took from their hands, fashioned it with an engraving tool, made it into a molten calf upon which they said, Ela Elekecha Yisrael, these are your gods, O Israel. Asher ha'alucha me'eretz Mitzrayim, who took you up, or brought you up, from the land of Egypt. Okay? So here, what is the... First of all, who's saying this? The Erev Ram. They're saying to the Jews, O Israel, here is your gods, who took you out of the land of Egypt. The, the multitude of people that are living amongst the Jewish nation. These other Egyptians that had joined the Jews that hadn't fully become committed to living a life dedicated to Hashem. But the point is, what are they saying? And what are the Jews accepting and not protesting against? Even the Jews that didn't sin, they didn't protest. These are the words that are being said. Ela Eloikecha Yisrael. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. That is not replacing Moshe. That's replacing the God who them out of Egypt. Remember I said, what was the first of the Ten Commandments? I am the Lord your God. Who took you out of the land of Egypt? They heard God say, not that they needed to hear God say, I mean, they actually had experience, they had all lived through the exodus of Egypt. But they had heard God saying, They had heard these words. So, how could they listen to verse number four as they're being told, These are your gods of Israel who took you out of the land of Egypt? When they know that this was their earring yesterday. Yesterday, this gold was on their ear. Now it's, uh, this is what took you out of Egypt. They knew where it came from. One well, thing you walk into like an idol shop or whatever, and you don't know where the idol came from, and some you know, priest hacked you a china and you know, made you crazy and made some hocus pocus and smoke in the room and whatever, and convinced you some holy God is one thing. They were the ones who took the earrings off their ears and put it into the fire. And I'm going to convince you that this earring that you took off your ear and put in the fire is the God that took you out of Egypt. They had lived through the exodus from Egypt. They knew it wasn't this golden calf that just came out of the fire yesterday, or that morning, the day yesterday. They knew that. So what does this verse mean? What, what, what are they saying? This is your God who took you out of Egypt. They know that this is not the God who took them out of Egypt. So now we're going to get a much deeper understanding of the whole story of the golden calf. Yes, you ready? You with me? Yes. You with me, okay. The Ramban explains something very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. And then basically, in short, the Jews created a golden calf not just to replace Moshe because they panicked that they didn't have Moshe. They were looking for a way to be spiritually connected to Hashem. The whole purpose of the golden calf was not only was not a rebellion against God, not only was it, I'm, I, I lost faith in God, so I need a new Moshe, because they believed in God, that's why they made a golden calf. How does he explain this? What did the Jews see at, this, at the giving of the Torah? The heavens are opened, and they saw the Kisei HaKov, the throne of God's glory, which is on the Markov, which is on the divine chariot. And there's a very, if you know a little Kabbalah, and you're familiar with the divine chariot and the four sides, it's explained at great length, Yechezkel. Ezekiel had a divine prophecy, right? The vision of Ezekiel, where he sees the four sides of the prophet, and very, very quickly, without getting too into it, what are the four sides of the prophet? Of the prophet? What are the four sides of the throne of God's glory, of the Markava? One side you have the birds, represented by the Pnei Nesher, the side of the face of an eagle. On one side you have Pnei Aryeh, face of a lion. The other side Pnei Shor, a face of an ox. And the front side the Pnei Adon, the face of a man. On top of that, it's a Kisah HaKav, the throne of God's glory. They saw this vision of the Markava, of the divine chariot. Meaning, I'm going to say this clear and simple, but clear. They saw an image of some form of divine image of a bird, of an eagle, 
that represented the entire uh, bird kingdom of all the spiritual birds that fly above. They saw a Pnei Arya, they saw the face of a lion representing to them a divine manifestation of wild animals. They saw a Pnei Shar, they saw a, an image of an ox, which represents a divine manifestation of all domesticated animals. And then they saw the Pnei Adam, the face of a man, which is a divine manifestation of how God comes into a world in the image or in the form of a human being. These four images are not forms of idol worship. They're not forms of idol worship. These four images are divine manifestations of God as God becomes in some way embraced or, in, or, or uh, um, that's what I'm looking for, dressed within or um, embedded within a physical expression of godliness. It's a basic idea in, 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 in creation of the universe. For God to create a physical world, God's light had to be embedded within a physical reality. That's creation. Correct? So the creation has different vessels or different forms, different manifestations that express different divine energies that then come out to different creations. So the divine energy of birds is different than the divine energy of wild animals, which is different than the, wild, than the divine energy and divine manifestation of domesticated animals, which is different than man. And there are four different sides, four different things. So the Jewish people, it's similar to the making of the Kruvim, which is very much connected to this, but it's, 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 too, mo it's too, too much, so I'm not getting into it. But it's connected, the idea of the Kruvim being a manifestation, as the way the Ramban explains it anyway, of God in a physical form. And so they decided we need, a, we need a physical expression of God. Because we're physical people. We live in the here and the now. We live in a tangible, physical world of physical form, physical matter. We need a physical way to connect to the spiritual, ethereal God. Till now, what was our physical connection to God? Moshe. Now that Moshe is gone, we don't know what happened to him. We need a new physical object that we can use as a method of spiritual connection. And therefore, they get to choose what method do we want to connect to. But what did the Jews want? The Jews wanted to go to Israel. And do what in Israel? Cultivate the land. That was the promise of the Jewish right? God said, we can take you out to the land flowing with milk and honey. So they're going to the land of Israel. So which divine manifestation do they want to hold on to? The Pnei Shar. The side of the chariot representing the face of the ox, or a calf as a baby ox, which represents cultivating the land. And therefore, why did the Jewish people make a golden calf? Not because they were looking for a new God. It's because they wanted a way that they as physical beings could connect to this God that was too great for them. So they said, let us take this vision that we saw at Har Sinai. This vision we saw when God was revealed to us. He was revealed through these different manifestations, through these different uh, forms. Let's take it. And let's make it begin our normal existence of agricultural society in Israel. Which is why also the side of gold, because the, the, the Pnei Shur, the side of the ox on the left side of the chariot. And gold, as opposed to silver, which is Ava on the right side, gold represents Gvura, which is on the left side. But that's really getting more Kabbalistic, and we're not going to go there right now. Understand? Making calf, or did the calf appear? No, the calf came alive. So yeah. going to the... the no, they threw it into the fire. Right. And the calf came out. Why did it come out? So now we have a third explanation of why a calf came out. Not from black magic, which he says, the Ramban explicitly says it could not be black magic. Not because Moshe's paper was there with the words rise up, O ox. But because this actual calf was indeed a manifestation of God in the form of an ox. There was godliness in this ox. Oh. So, why did they get mad at him? That was both your question. But do you understand what the Ramban is saying? This golden calf was not, a, was not an act of rebellion against Hashem. It was an act of closeness to Hashem. They wanted to connect. So what was the sin? What was the sin? So you need to understand, what's the sin of, golden, of idolatry in general? 
Well, let me answer this question first. What's the sin of idolatry? How did idolatry begin? So the Rambam, not Ramban, the Rambam explains, how does idolatry begin? Where you begin to give the ability of free choice to the tools of God. Which means that when God created the world, God created the world with the forces of nature. God created the sun and the moon and the stars and the constellations and the, 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 the plants and the... All the different forces of nature that make a world exist are tools of God by which the world is made to exist. Correct? We all know that. It's a basic idea. How did idolatry begin? In the beginning of time, all men worshipped God. And they recognized that the tools of nature are nothing more than tools. So when you see someone build a bookcase, right? I'm building a bookcase finally, only two years later. And you see nails going and screws going. And you don't say, thank you, Mr. Screwdriver, for putting the screws into the... Right? You don't say that. You say, thank you, Mr. Builderman, for holding a drill in your hand and putting a... Right? That's what you say. You, it's obvious and clear that the drill is not what built the bookcase. The person who built the bookcase... He needs tools to build it. You can't build it with your bare hands. But the tools are nothing more than the tools of the builder. The tools have no free choice. They have no free will. Correct? What's the sin of idolatry? When you begin to worship the tool and give Bechira, give the ability of choice to the tool to think that if I don't worship the tool, the tool won't give me what I want. That's what idolatry is. Idolatry is when you begin to think that if I don't worship the sun, the sun will no longer give me what I need for my food to grow. If I don't worship whatever the, the moon, then whatever the moon gives to the world, I won't get it anymore. Because the moon has the ability to give or not give me what I want or what I need. When you should realize that God tells the moon to give exactly what the moon's going to give and to tell the wind to give what the wind's going to do and to make the grass grow and the tree, the, the produce grow and the crops grow and the trees grow and the apples grow. The growing of the tree is not because the tree has to be worshipped. The growing of the tree is because God said the tree should grow. And the only one to pray to is the God that controls the tree. So, there, so God has physical manifestations of His divine light in the world. And the Pnei Shar, the face of the ox, is indeed a legitimate side and manifestation of God's energy into the world. The problem is, they said, Eile Elekech Yisrael. Verse number four. They said, this is your God that took you out of Egypt. They now started to think, they knew that God, that, that who took them out of Egypt, as the Rabbi said, they weren't fools. They knew that these earrings were on their ears. They knew that. But they are worshiping the Baal Hatsura. Those are the words. They were worshiping the Baal Hatsura, the owner of the image, as if now the image did it. Yeah. So, her, with all that, how are you explaining away that? that these are your gods that brought you out of Egypt. No, that's where they sinned. They started to worship this. This is God. But instead of realizing this is just a tool of God, a manifestation of God, said this itself is now its own God. And so now they were worshipping this physical object, not, as a, not to replace God. They knew it was a manifestation of God. But they now were giving credence to the actual physical expression of it. But who was saying that? That was the Arab. Right. Right. The point is, let me be clear. They didn't deny God when they made this golden calf. They weren't trying to run away from God or replace God at all. They wanted something they could touch of God. And now that they could touch it, they began to put their focus onto what they could touch instead of recognizing that what they're touching is just an expression of that which they can't touch. Usually the simplest explanation is, is like another explanation could be, this is from uh, Rabbi Jonathan, it could be <laughs> that fake news has always been around forever. Maybe the Arab Rav said, okay, Moshe Scott, this is what we're going to do. We're going we're gonna to do what everybody does, the government does, give you fake news. This is... These are the guys that took you out of Egypt. This is the mask that's going to protect you from the virus. You get it? It's fake news. That's all it is. I don't know what to do with the golden calf, though. In, so, in other words, the Arab is giving you, okay, these are your new masters. It, it doesn't yeah, but the Jews have to listen to it. The Jews have to accept it. Meaning, uh, the point is, Ramban explains it uh, in a very, very beautiful way. There was a divine manifestation of the four sides of the Markov, that they, of the chari that they saw at Mount Sinai. They were only creating a physical, tangible 
handle, so to say, for a God that was too hard, too spiritual, too ethereal for them to, to, to reach. That's what they're doing. So we have a new understanding on the spiritual level of the sin of the golden calf. So now I'm going to ask you the same question again. Can we relate to this sin of people prioritizing the here and the now and the tangible that they can touch and see and feel over that which you can't see and you can't feel and you can't hear and you can't touch and say, instead of focusing and prioritizing a God that is ethereal, instead of focusing on the world to come, on what is true, on what is real, on what is for the future, what is eternal, instead... I need something that I can touch. I need something that's here in the moment, here in the now. Right. Can we relate to that? Yeah. How many of us get distracted and focused on what we currently have in a physical way at the same time that we admit that what we have is from God? It's not that we worship what we have because we think that it's separate from God. I know that my money is a gift from God. Oh, say it good. My money is a gift from God. My health is a gift from God. What I have is all from God. At the same time that I'll say that what I have is an expression, a manifestation of God in the physical form, I'll forget that the physical form is the only manifestation, and I'll begin to worship the money that I have. Still? <laughs> meaning, meaning, what's our money? What's our gold? Our gold, well, golden calf is gold, right? There's not only money, but money is a perfect example. As, uh, we can all relate to it. Everyone cares about money. What's money? It's a manifestation of God's blessing in the world. And every one of us sitting in this room knows that, acknowledges that, uh, understands that. And yet, many people don't give 10% of their money to stuff. Why not? Why does a person not give money? and not give a tithe to charity? Because I don't have enough money to live if I give 10% of my money to charity. That's, uh, that's crazy. How can I do that? I'm not going to have... But thank God for all my money. <laughs> That's the golden calf. That's the golden calf. I know that God is God. I don't for a moment forget that He took me out of Egypt and He saved me. Everything I have, I owe to Him. Everything I have, I owe to Him. But I need to focus on the here and now. I can't see that God. I, I'm missing money. I don't have enough money in my account. I'm going to give charity and... I, I'm panicking. How am I going to survive? What am I going to do? The, the, the expression of God that I can relate to, I don't see it. I'm in panic. I need a new, I need a new expression. On a deeper level, a d- divine manifestation. That is the sin of the golden calf. Yeah? We take care... I'll give you another example. It's not money. I know that to be healthy, I need God's blessings, Right? And yet, how many people put so much emphasis onto their health that they give up going to shul, or give up eating kosher, or give up whatever it is. I need to go to the gym, I need to go to the dark, I need to sleep. If you recognize that your health is a gift from Hashem, like the Jews who recognize that they need a God, and everything is about God, and yet, at the very same moment that we're saying we believe in God, and you know, I need God to be healthy, at that very same moment, what are we doing? We're prioritizing the here and the now, the way I feel, over doing what God wants me to do. So I'm focusing on the expression of God in the world over connecting to the owner of the expression. I'm focusing on the Pnei Shar, on the face of the ox, on the golden calf, instead of remembering the Baal Hatsura, the owner of this expression, the, the source of this golden manifestation of God's blessings in the world. Can we relate to that? Are we not guilty? It says the Talmud, well, it's not the Talmud, sorry, it's a statement, look at text number four, very beautiful statement from the Sefer Achai in the Book of Life, chapter two. It's beautiful, in Hebrew it sounds much better than English though. Because in Hebrew it rhymes. No, in Hebrew it's a good rhyme. People say, Adam People worried about the loss of their money. And it's a rhyme. But they don't worry about the loss of their days. We say, if I ask you, I've done this in JLI, I was only finished the thing. His money, his money won't help him, and his days won't return to him. So I ask you, what's more important, your money or your time? What's your, your time is more important than your money. Okay. 
When's the last, how, what, did it ever happen to you that you spent a half hour, an hour on the phone fighting with a company for $10 on your... Uh... All the time. All the time. <laughs> Serious question. You say without blinking an eye, my time is much more valuable to me than my, than my money. But how much time will you spend on the internet looking to find an airline ticket that's $4 cheaper and comparing every price you're just looking for, I don't know, you're buying a pair of shoes or whatever, and you'll shop on 15 different websites, spend two hours searching and searching, waiting for a deal, we make yourselves a mishugas trying to save money. Oh, my time is much more important than my money, but I just wasted three hours to try and save 10 bucks. It feels good. It feels good. The that's point... The the that's right. The point is, whenever we are focused on the tangible that we can touch and we can see and we can feel, and at the same time that we're focusing on it, we say, it's only an expression of God in the world. It's only to replace Moshe. I believe in God. I just need something physical I can relate to. And so we focus on the moment, instead of focusing on what's real, on the future, on what's ethereal, on what's God, and instead we get distracted by the expression of God in the world, whether it's the money of God in the world, or whether it's health, or whether it's our time, or whether it's whatever it is. And we get distracted on our golden calf and begin to think that this is not, we forget that it's only an expression of God. It's only a, a way of God leading us through the desert. But it's not God himself. But we begin to worship that as God and focus our energy on that instead of on the source of that. Then we are doing exactly what the Jewish people did in the desert. Exactly. No different. No different. Sure. <laughs> Any single time that we focus on what's here and now in front of us and what's physical and tangible that we can hold, that we can see, that we can talk to, that we can, that we can count it, that we can quantify it and qualify it and put it into a bank account and say, I have X amount of money, X amount of blessing, X amount of this, I have this kind of job, this kind of income, this kind of 401k, this kind of investment, this kind of... Uh, car, this kind of uh, uh, relationship, this kind of, anything that we focus on. And we begin, and, we, and at the same time, that we acknowledge and we recognize that this is all a gift from Hashem. And at the same time that we won't give Maizah from that, that we won't give a tithe from that, or that we're not willing to use that money from Hashem for something holy that God wants us to use, because we're worried about the here and the now, and we forget about that this is only an expression of God. It's only a manifestation of God in the world. The moment that that happens, we're worshiping the calf. We're worshiping the Pnei Shah. We're worshiping the divine manifestation of a domesticated animal, which is income, Parnassah, instead of recognizing that this is nothing more than the manifestation of God. And so we become so focused on the expression of God, we forget about the God himself. We're so focused on the fact that the builder has a drill in his hand that we're thanking the drill for making the bookcase instead of recognizing that it was Ira that built the bookcase. Understand? So we're worshiping the expression of God, not God himself. Yeah. We're, we're, we're worshiping the here and the now. What we can touch. And forgetting that what we can touch is only an expression of God. If you want to, you say... Okay. <laughs> you can say it also in a different way. I'm not talking about money and physical things. But it's also, if you want to be a little bit more esoteric, it's also true with spiritual experiences. When people say, I want to be close to Hashem. Right? Why do the Jews worship the golden calf? Why do they make it? Not because they were denying God, because they wanted to get close to God. So how do they get close to God? Not by saying, let me focus on God, but rather they focus on what makes me feel good here now. How do I feel? I feel afraid. I need something that I can see, that I can touch, that I can quantify. So you have many Jews, they want to be spiritual, they want to be godly, but only ways that make them feel good. Only ways that they can touch, that they can see, that they can say, oh, I meditated for an hour, and now I feel spiritual, I feel uplifted, I feel cleansed, I feel, you know, that, that was a good spiritual experience. Praying, I don't feel it. I'm talking to a God I can't see. There's no, nothing in it for me. I don't get anything out of it. That's another more the more abstract way of saying the exact same thing. The golden calf was money, but it's also the spiritual experience. So I'm saying the exact same thing. Different people can relate to different things. Some people get distracted with the gold as an expression. And they say, it's not a denial of God. Not a, I don't believe in God. I acknowledge my money is a gift from God, but all I care about is my money. 
I acknowledge that being spiritual is about connecting to God. But it's not about God. It's about how I feel in the experience of being spiritual. It sounds crazy, but that's exactly what people say all the time, every day. I want to be spiritual. Why? Because if you're spiritual, it's you're connecting to God. You're being more holy. So how do I define spirituality? About the way I feel from it. Understand? I don't have a good like, uh, story, but uh, I mean, I think the point is... Uh, it's there. It's not, the point is, the golden calf is not so far-fetched. We're all guilty of being so focused on, the, on, on what we can touch, on what we can see, on what we can hold in our hands, on what we can relate to, that even though we acknowledge that it's an expression of God, we, we, can't, we can't get past what we're seeing. And we forget that the expression of God, that's it. It's just an expression of God. It's not God. It's just the tool in the hands of the builder. It's the, it's, it's the uh, you know, it's the, it's the waiter, the restaurant. It's not, it's not the person that, whose food it is. Okay, my friends. I look up. Sunday, February 27th is Judaism, the soundtrack. To be a very, very nice evening. We'll have dinner and uh, different musical nagunim experiences with explanations of each one, stories and uh, explanations of the history and the, the message of the songs. Sign up. God willing, March 17th is going to be Purim in the Wild West. Thursday, March 17th, it's going to be outdoors. Uh, we have a committee, we're working on it. Yes, Purim in the Wild West. We have a lot of fun. We're going to mechanical rodeo bull. We'll have a bonfire with s'mores, a hamatash s'mores. We'll have cowboy games. Hamatash s'mores. An open salon, bar. <laughs> yeah. a saloon. A saloon or salon? Saloon. Do you spell it with one O or two O's? Two O's. Oh, we got to fix that. <laughs> Karina, two of us. And I'm looking at the comments. Faith says God's bank. Sarah says you're right. Sarah, it's good to see you're watching, Sarah. Anyway, that's the story, my friends. Yeah, years ago. Remember? Yeah, we did the Wild West. It was a hit. Oh, okay. I have to go find that video of me from doing it. I should find that video of me on the rodeo bull in my Indian chief costume, send that out as, a, uh, as an advertisement. Come. <laughs> Come see the Indian chief rabbi. Okay, anyway, my friends, Laila Tov. And uh, only blessings, only good things.